One of the many strange things about our time as far as technology goes, and there are indeed many strange things, it's getting weird out there, is the possibility of de-extinction of species that disappeared from the Earth long ago. This is going to be regular and huge news from here on out as efforts to do this mount, and the problems, ethics, and questions involving this will also mount in coming years as well. There are many stories about the extinction in science fiction and speculative science. Could we bring back the dinosaurs and build Jurassic Park, or could we resurrect a mammoth from frozen tissue? The answer to this since the dawn of genetics simply has been that in principle, yes, so long as you have the genome mapped and a method of actually bringing an extinct species to term using a related living species. That's tricky, and even trickier, actually basically impossible without a miracle find, is getting any DNA as old as that of a dinosaur that hasn't completely fallen apart, a jumbled mess of fragments at best, or as is almost entirely the case, completely replaced with rock. Even amber, the MacGuffin of sorts, that allowed the resurrection of the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park is problematic in that yes, it preserves some structures of insects and life quite well, but it does not provide a perfect method of preserving DNA, making it highly unlikely that usable DNA that could be proven to be from a dinosaur could ever be extracted to the level of what would be needed to reconstruct a genome, even from a mythical perfect specimen that probably does not exist. Even though preserved soft tissues from dinosaurs buried very deeply in fossil bones have been found. Fun in science fiction, but in reality it's very highly unlikely anything viable could be found. Though it actually may be non-zero, stranger things have happened. And you could always opt to build a dinosaur genetically from the ground up, that has to be said. A greater command of the ins and outs an understanding of the extreme complexity of genetics through AI and quantum computing might just produce some kind of an artificial dinosaur at some point. That said, the mammoth is much more possible because they've only been extinct for a geologically short period of time, most of them having gone extinct by about 10,000 years ago, but with holdouts in places like Wrangell Island in the Arctic Ocean that seem to have survived up until about 4,000 years ago. Frozen tissue from a mammoth can be viable as far as extracting DNA. Some have an even better chance. Animals like the thylacine have been extinct only four decades, which means fresher, potentially less degraded DNA samples. But when we come to a species known as the dire wolf, and much ado is being made in the media right now about this animal, gone also for about 10,000 years, has now been resurrected successfully. Or has it? Sensationalism aside, there are two sides to this story that require a rethinking outside of the popular media. It starts with an interesting company called Colossal Biosciences, which seeks to not only try to bring back some animals from extinction, but use the knowledge gained from that to preserve endangered species that are still with us, using cloning and genetic techniques. They even have spin-off companies working on things like bacteria that can eat microplastics. All very interesting, very useful stuff. But have they really brought back the extinct dire wolf and provided the world with the first example of a true de-extinction? First, what is a dire wolf? Scientific name, Anacyon dirus. The dire wolf is what it sounds like, an extinct large species of Ice Age wolf. They were indigenous to the Americas during the end of the Pleistocene and beginning of the Holocene epochs say about 125,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago. They had several subspecies, and were particularly well represented in the famous La Brea Tar Pits deposits near Los Angeles. While an Ice Age species, the dire wolf seemed to be able to operate in a variety of habitats, ranging from forested mountain areas to grasslands and arid savannas. What they were limited by was the proximity of the Laurentide and Cordilleran ice sheets extending down from the north during this time. What's really important to remember here though is what this wolf seemed to be adapted for in order to hunt. The wolves we have now aren't all that specialized, they can eat a variety of species. Whereas the dire wolf seems to have been more specialized to macrofauna of that age, which means they were highly sensitive to the end of the ice age because their food, things like mammoths, were also highly sensitive to the end of the Ice Age, 
In short, the dire wolf left this earth because its food went extinct, or so the current thinking goes. The thing about the dire wolf though is that it's not that different from a modern gray wolf, our familiar Canis lupus, at least in appearance. The dire wolf looks close. It's whiter than a gray wolf, but genetically it's actually a bit distant, it turns out, based on work from 2021. Jackals are actually more related to the gray wolf than the dire wolf was, despite the resemblance. The dire wolf's skull structure is virtually identical to the gray wolf, a little wider, but the teeth were different. They were larger and had particularly good shearing ability. The species also appears to have had significantly stronger jaw muscles. This was a formidable wolf, for sure, with a magnificent bite built to take down a mammoth. Whether humans ever interacted with the dire wolf is unknown. Humans appear in the Americas right about the time the dire wolf went extinct, raising the question of whether our own hunting of macrofauna might have been in competition with the wolves and might have played a role in their extinction. As an aside, we often hear one side of the story where when humans move into an area that they may contribute to the extinction events for some species. But there are actually cases where the opposite may have happened. One is that the avocado may well have gone extinct if humans hadn't shown up in its native habitat in the Americas and started cultivating it and spreading it because it seems to have been dependent on macrofauna to spread its seeds through their digestive tracts otherwise. And without macrofauna, like the giant ground sloth which went extinct, it was disappearing. I'm glad they saved the avocado, as I rather enjoy them with a sprinkling of salt. But our efforts to save endangered species are not new. But back to the wolves. On October 1st of last year, something at least like a dire wolf was born at Colossal Biosciences. Actually, several of them. The three pups are two males called Romulus and Remus after the mythical founders of Rome in ancient times. But the story goes they were suckled from a she-wolf. And a female known as Khaleesi, a Game of Thrones reference there, born in January of this year. This is also the company that recently announced the creation of the woolly mouse. Another story entirely. But basically they made a mouse with mammoth hair or something like that. They are also working with the genome of the aforementioned thylacine. So what's going around about this story has not actually been released officially, but the genome of the dire wolf is purported to be about 99.5% similar to a gray wolf. To compare, humans and chimpanzees are 98.8% similar. Even still, 99.5% still leaves a huge amount of room for differences in DNA. Millions of differences, important to note here. Genetics is unbelievably complicated, and that will factor in shortly. What Colossal did was edit 20 genes to basically turn a gray wolf into a dire wolf. A point of criticism, because we don't completely know or agree on what makes a species a species. A new scientist reports that five of those have to do with color that isn't from ancient DNA, but genes that produce light coats in some gray wolves. The remaining 15 are copied, which is important copied from the dire wolf genome samples, but not the actual ancient DNA itself. That may not be enough to make a true dire wolf, depending on how you define a species to arrive at something a taxonomist would say is the same species as the extinct dire wolf. It's not there. But it does look like one, so they think. Now this is just me for a moment. There are instances, rather odd ones, that give me pause about talking about what animals looked like that went extinct long before recorded history. This is a very modern male lion with a mane, as we're all familiar with, Panthera leo. There was a very similar species that is now extinct for 13,000 years called a cave or steppe lion. And while fossil evidence and even mummified remains have been found, there was the lingering question of whether males of this species, Panthera spelea, lacked manes or had them. But that's two species of the same genus. In the case of gray wolves and dire wolves, they are not the same genus, thus much more distant from each other. So I find myself skeptical that we know entirely what these wolves looked like in adult life. Maybe there might be surprises there. In 1994, a cave in France, Chauvet Cave, was found and it is a time capsule. The cave once had a large entrance to the outside world that was completely cut off by a landslide, sealing the interior off other than a very small access space, basically a crack in the mountain, that no one knew about until the discovery in modern times. 
The cave, now painstakingly curated and preserved, was absolutely full of cave paintings by humans going back as early as 37,000 years ago at least. Some of those paintings are of cave lions, and one in particular that had male anatomy in the depiction has no mane. There's still debate about what that meant. Maybe the manes were variable. Some other paintings seem to show that. But the fact is, you can't just look at a skeleton of this prehistoric lion and assume it looked like a modern lion. Since no one in thousands of years has seen a dire wolf, it's hard to know what variations there were. DNA is complicated, even when you have random desiccated fossil evidence. The mind-blowing idea of a human potentially tens of thousands of years ago leaving us an answer to a scientific question about cave lion manes aside, I wonder if we really know what dire wolves look like, and whether the idea of taking genes intended to make a genetically modified wolf look like a dire wolf is going to hit the bar of actually being a dire wolf. That debate remains to be had. But that debate will go further because once a species goes extinct, specifically in regards to the distant past, if you bring it back and reintroduce it into nature, then you are probably going to have numerous unintended consequences. This has been bad enough with things like reintroducing non-native cane toads to eat beetles that are the natural food of certain marsupials, causing them to nearly go extinct. And many, many other cases of the road to ruin is paved with good intentions tells us that we don't really have enough of a handle on ecosystem balances to really start reintroducing animals that went extinct because of the retreat of an ice age. And the reality is, cloning animals or building genetic codes is difficult. You can change one thing, but that gene might govern a great many other things you aren't aware of changing the outcome. And then there is the question of putting a different species to gestate in a surrogate, which gets into questions of animal cruelty issues. In the case of the wolves, the surrogates were large dogs, and not even gray wolves, reportedly. At the same time, there is a point of view out there that you don't need that many genetic changes to get to a dire wolf. Wolves have about 19,000 genes, and if you change just 20 of them to look like a dire wolf, you do get major differences from a gray wolf. You get the white fur, but also a number of other differences, and interesting differences in vocalization. They howl and whine a bit differently, reportedly. The models for the gene edits were from two DNA samples. One a 72,000-year-old ear bone from Idaho and the other a 13,000-year-old tooth from Ohio. This is best described perhaps as some hybrid of cloning and gene editing. And what happens is that the DNA in the nucleus of an ovum is replaced with an edited nucleus and an embryo develops that is inserted into a surrogate to carry it. You then get something like a genetically similar, if not identical, copy of the donor. Sort of like removing pages from a book and replacing them with altered versions of the same text, but the book remains mostly the same, which I couldn't call it original. Once development got to a sufficient level, the animals were delivered by C-section, and the surrogates seemed to naturally accept the pups once born. But that lasted only a short time, until the humans took over and raised the pups with bottles until weaning. At this point, the wolves live safely in a preserve and are eating full-on meat given to them, but kept isolated from their keepers for safety. But they do not appear to be any more aggressive than any captive wolf. They so far aren't even interested in live prey, any more than any captive wolf with a nice, plentiful, human-provided food supply does. In short, they basically act mostly, but not entirely, like captive wolves, but with an interesting coloration and mannerisms and howling and they show personalities, like mammals and many other animals do. The company's timeline is to produce a woolly mammoth birth by 2028. All elephants have a long gestation rate, 22 months in most cases, so that is ambitious. The question is, where do you put a mammoth in 2028 in the wild, outside of a preserve or a zoo to live naturally? That's not an easy question to answer, because this planet has changed since they were last here. And is it really a mammoth? or an artificial GMO creature? Tell me what you think in the comments below. Thanks for listening. I'm futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently concerned about bringing back the giant ground sloth in the interests of avocado health. I asked an avocado in the fridge, and it certainly seemed to be the ultimate in indifference. And then I wondered if the seemingly rather leisurely giant ground sloth of old might actually be enjoying a very chill, unhurried existence in extinction. It's like the ultimate in leisurely retirement plans. 
Very troubling extinction. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.